Valiant Warriors for Truth, as I see you all here. Very proud of you and um, very glad to be here. I've heard so much about you and I am very admiring of your cause. Now, I chose the topic of this talk, Curse of the Fright Bats, uh, in honour of my friend and fellow journalist Tim Blair. Now, he coined this delicious word, Fright Bat to describe Australia's left-wing ladies' auxiliary. Now, these are feminists who claim to be victims of misogyny and sexism while abusing men and haranguing other women who don't agree with them. Now, that would be any women at this conference. I see you out there, and so bravo to all the non-fright bats out there. You are the antidote to the misandry that is hurting our sons. The existence of this conference is proof that the pendulum is swinging back to fairness and common sense. Now, I write a syndicated opinion column that I have done so for 20 years in Sydney, first for uh, one news organisation, the Fairfax Group, which is you'd call the left-wing group, and now for News Corp papers across the country. And my viewpoint is conservative, and so, unfortunately, I can't hide my rather unfashionable opinions just to be polite at dinner parties. Everyone knows where I stand before they meet me. But becoming the mother of sons made me fiercely protective of the male species and acutely aware of the character assassination of boys that modern feminism has been all about, at least since I've been noticing the last couple of decades, criminalising the very state of being a boy. And this is what I write about often. Needless to say, it has put me on a collision course with fright bats. Fright bats demand respect for women, but actually they only mean women like them. You just have to watch them tear down any woman who does not parrot the feminist dogma about the patriarchy, rape culture, abortion on demand, the gender pay gap, and domestic violence. Domestic violence, so many lies are told. And here's one. We are told by our government here in Australia that domestic violence is an epidemic and that every man in Australia is an incipient woman basher. That's simply not true. But to make the narrative work, they had to change the facts. So the definition of domestic violence was altered to include verbal abuse, financial abuse or emotional manipulation. This cleverly ensures that any disagreement between a man and a woman could be categorised as something far more serious for the purposes of, say, a custody battle. So trivial allegations potentially can become grounds for denying a father access to his children. And sure enough, in this country, one in four domestic violence allegations that come before the family court are bogus. Here's another lie about domestic violence. And for reasons that only a pathological narcissist could understand, feminist fright bats in Australia decided that domestic violence was a problem really only for women like them. In posh parts of Australia, like Turak and Paddington and Mossman, this is just a lie. The reality is that domestic violence in Australia is overwhelmingly concentrated in dysfunctional, remote Indigenous communities and public housing estates on the fringes of our cities. A woman in Burke in outback New South Wales with a large Indigenous population, for instance, is 60 times more likely to be a victim of domestic violence than a woman who lives in Sydney's affluent North Shore. 
a woman in outback Walgett is 20 times more likely to be a victim of domestic violence than a woman in leafy Mossman. So domestic violence hotspots are where you probably already know they are. Communities with a high Indigenous population in the Northern Territory, in impoverished rural towns, in the urban fringes where the underclass lives. Wherever welfare has emasculated men, wherever unemployment is high and education poor, and where drug and alcohol abuse is rife. These are the preconditions for violence of all kinds against women, against men, and especially against children. Now, if governments were serious about domestic violence, they would target family dysfunction in communities most at risk, overwhelmingly welfare-dependent and Indigenous communities. But these are not facts that the man-bashing femi-fascists who control the domestic violence industry in this country want to hear. And nor does the Australian government want to listen since it has spent $100 million in the last couple of years on a campaign blaming domestic violence on so-called gender inequality. In the words of Natasha Stott Despoyer, Australia's former ambassador for women and girls, there was never an ambassador for men and boys, she also heads domestic violence NGO Our Watch, and she says violence against women does not discriminate regardless of ethnicity, social status and geography. Only actually it does discriminate a lot. Demonising all men and pouring taxpayer money into permanent bureaucracies will do nothing to alleviate domestic tragedy. It just increases government's role in our lives and it disempowers already vulnerable men. Now, whenever I write these facts in my columns or talk about them on my radio shows, the response from the Fright Bats is hysterical and over the top. They've tried to get me sacked, silenced and even banned from Twitter, which isn't such a bad thing, actually. <laughs> And last time they called for my sterilisation, they branded me a murder apologist, a troll, a sicko, an idiot, a bimbo, a vile creature, dangerous to kids, nasty and vicious, stupid, a disgrace, a rabid old hate monger, a typical Australian. Your victim blaming has done almost as much harm to victims of domestic violence as the abusers, read one email. The faux rage meter is always at full tilt when it comes to domestic violence. But I value these intemperate expressions because they are more evidence of a concerted attempt to cover up the truth. Domestic violence is the last frontier of feminism. It is the fright bat's ultimate weapon against men. They seem to care more about grabbing power and public funding, however, than about saving women from violent men. You might think that women had already achieved equality in Australia in the traditional markers of status in our society, most obviously in higher education, where more than 60% of our university graduates are female. But for feminism to remain relevant, it needs to extend victim status even to the most affluent, pampered women of the chattering classes. So this is the biggest lie about domestic violence in this country, that all women are equally at risk and all men are potentially perpetrators. But what about violent women? Never acknowledged by the Fright Bats is the fact that more than one-third of Australian victims of domestic violence are male, and those figures are underreported because men are less likely to report the abuse or be taken seriously. Of almost 200 victims killed in 2010-12 by an offender with whom they shared a domestic relationship, almost 40% were male. Another lie, there is no epidemic of violence against women as our government keeps on telling us. Domestic violence homicides have declined sharply in Australia to the lowest rate in 25 years. 
but somehow we're suddenly in crisis mode. 1.5% of women have reported that they've uh, suffered physical or sexual violence or threat by a partner or ex-partner in the previous 12 months. These rates have been stable for a decade. But when it comes to men, the trend is going in the opposite direction. There has been an increase in domestic violence against males, or at least the reporting of it. Rates rose by 50% between 2005 and 2012. Where's the public service announcement on that? Where's the hashtag activism? Nothing but silence. No one cares. If you really wanted to break the so-called cycle of violence, you could start by ending the welfare incentives for unsuitable women to keep having children to a string of feckless men and not look after them. <clears throat> well, I'm glad that you applauded because when I wrote this in a column, a couple of columns, the fright bats popped a gasket. <laughs> they pretended that I had labelled victims of domestic violence unsuitable women. They deliberately chose to misunderstand. Their aim is to avoid the far more difficult reality, a truth that is impervious to hashtags, that boys and girls brought up in an environment of chaos, dysfunction, violence and fatherlessness who are neglected and abused, are more likely to become abusive, violent adults with poor impulse control. And so the cycle continues. But fright bats ignore that and they continue their campaigns such as Destroy the Joints. Uh, there's an, that's the name of an activist group, Destroy the Joints. They have a project called Counting Dead Women. And they keep on insisting that domestic violence is a gender issue and they prove this by their Facebook page, Counting Dead Women, and it's just volunteers, volunteer fright bats, typing in what they read in the papers and tallying up a death toll at the end of every month and hyping it in their Twitter feeds. Now, the clear message is that all these dead women are killed by their intimate partners who are all males. In fact, when I last looked uh, at the, the numbers that they'd put up, only about half of the homicides cited could be classified as having a male partner or ex-partner identified as the killer or the alleged killer. Some of these victims were killed by women, by sisters, by daughters, a female neighbour in one case, or in another case, a female ex-lover of the victim's husband as well as by brothers, fathers and sons. So domestic violence is serious enough without exaggerating. The activists just cherry-pick facts to support their dogma rather than using statistics to better target scarce resources to help the actual victims, the most vulnerable victims, and to address the root causes of domestic violence. Now, the patron saint of Australia's domestic violence industry is a poor woman named Rosie Batty. Now, she was named Australian of the Year a couple of years ago, and she has become the unimpeachable expert on domestic violence because of her own terrible tragedy. Her only son, 11-year-old Luke, was murdered by his father. He was bashed over the head with a cricket bat and then stabbed to death in front of horrified onlookers at a suburban cricket field. Three years later, Rosie Batty has become the go-to victim for journalists doing a domestic violence story, of course. And her line is the fashionable one, that domestic violence is a gender issue and that the only way to stop it is to ensure that men respect women. But it makes no sense. The victim in her case was not a woman, he was a boy. It just shows how powerful is the narrative that the victim's own mother can ignore the logical flaw in her argument. Her estranged husband was a mentally ill drug taker. Commanding him to respect women would not have saved Luke's life. 
Drug and alcohol abuse and mental illness are specific problems which properly targeted government policy might help to alleviate. But the motherhood statement, respect women, is not a specific problem which any government policy can help. Now, I know that Cassie J, I think, flummoxed the hosts of the project this week when, good for her. <laughs> She had this wonderfully refreshing guilelessness when she went into the lion's den there. And uh, they, they, of course, um, she was getting the better of them on domestic violence. And so they waved their magic wand and their magic uh, rosy batty icon and, um, and told her the story and thought she probably didn't understand. But said Cassie, wasn't the victim male, not female? So how can it be a gender issue? That's the honest logic, and that is the real point. The campaign is not about helping victims of domestic violence. It is really about demonising men. And slandering men does not encourage respect for women. In fact, it has the opposite effect. Yet every government in this country, state and federal, has united around a destructive, evidence-free myth that demonises little boys, patronises little girls and insults families. The theory is that gender stereotypes somehow lead to domestic violence, but there is absolutely no proof of that. And if you ask the architects of these campaigns as Senator David Lionhelm, an independent senator, a, a social democrat, um, he asked them in a Senate estimates inquiry. They had no answers for him. They had no research to back up their expensive campaign that they are rolling out across the country. The campaign now teaches in primary schools that hidden meanings in phrases such as boys will be boys and man up will lead to domestic violence. Where is the credible evidence to show that labelling three-year-old boys sexist and denying children tales of Cinderella and Snow White will prevent domestic violence? There is no evidence. It doesn't exist. The whole crackpot notion defies common sense and defies the reality lived by Australian parents every day. It is just a taxpayer-funded attempt by gender-bending social engineers to control what we say and how we think, to inject identity politics into every aspect of our lives using the excuse of preventing domestic violence. Our children are harassed by gullible teachers programmed by weirdo academics into dictating that boys cannot be boys and girls cannot be girls and somehow this is going to prevent domestic violence. And the insult at the heart of the government's domestic violence campaign is that Australian parents are committing the thought crime of unconscious bias teaching their sons to be wife bashers without knowing it, teaching their daughters to be docile victims. And parents, Australian parents, need a government information campaign to change their thinking. It is official state-sanctioned misandry to pretend that all men and boys are incipient wife bashers who need to be brought to heel. And boys grow up in this bath of societal disapproval. They are in trouble in preschool for not wearing tutus. In the classroom, there are too few male teachers and too many female teachers who have no patience for fidgeting boys with an excess of physical energy. Too many boys are prescribed ADHD drugs or end up absorbing the lesson that there is something intrinsically wrong with being a boy. 
No wonder there is this sudden trend appearing for boys who think that they have to become girls when the world is telling them that masculinity is toxic. Men just have to cop being labelled misogynists, killers, rapists, perpetrators of domestic violence, and they can't complain. If they retaliate, they are called insane and violent, and the vitriolic fright bat warriors who have been baiting them every day suddenly become cowering victims of their oppression. No wonder male suicide is skyrocketing in this country. A third of all deaths of young men and a doubling of suicide rates among teenage males in the past decade. And yet the response to this crisis of boyhood, which is going on underneath our noses, is to invent an entirely fictitious epidemic of domestic violence against women to bash men. Meanwhile, the actual epidemic of child abuse is ignored by comparison. <clears throat> Around the country every day, increasing numbers of children are tortured, abused and neglected. They are trapped in a living hell to which they are returned over and over and over by authorities. That is an epidemic. That is a crisis. And unlike adult women in abusive relationships, children have no choice about staying. And demonising their fathers certainly does not help. Thank you. <clears throat> Questions, hello, just in the front here. Sorry, just, wait, just wait. Thank you. Um, I, I live in Mosman and uh, there is <laughs> quite a lot of abuse there. There's verbal abuse, there's financial abuse, there's psychological abuse. I know this because a lot of my mates tell me that they're copying that from their <laughs> wives. And I mean that. Some of them are getting by on antidepressant drugs because they don't want to leave their families because of everything we've spoken about and their lives are a misery. They've worked hard all their lives to provide. And I myself was a victim of this up until about a year ago. I'm now away from my 13 and 15 year old sons who are now copying it from the same person. Look, I, I, I know that milieu very well because uh, I live uh, in that area and um, I and some of my friends are the wives of those men and I um, you know I, I work a lot of the time so I don't have the luxury of sitting around in coffee shops like a lot of them have and do but I do occasionally join them and I remember uh, I have a couple of girlfriends we've discussed it um, saying to each other all they do is sit there and bitch and moan about their husbands who, you know, have gone off to work every day while they have the luxury of not working because in those affluent suburbs they don't have to and they go to the gym and they play golf and they pick up the kids from school and they're exhausted by that heavy duty work ethic that they seem to think they have. And they complain all the time about their husbands. And I think, um, you know, there's something to be said for that old-fashioned kind of archetype uh, of, that we, we saw in, you know, programs growing up. Um, that, that sort of... I mean, I never experienced it because my mother was working as well, but I used to uh, <laughs> sort of think I would like to have that kind of a family where the mother was at home in an apron and baking and... Um, and, you know, when the husband came home, she gave put the slippers out and so on. I, and, you know, I, I think that there is a new generation of women, I hope, who have grown up with, um, you know, working-driven mothers and who have vowed that they are not going to do that themselves to their own children and who uh, look askance at the wives who take their hard-working husbands for granted. 
But I do, um, just in one word of apology for those women, uh, it's not just their fault. I mean, we are social animals and we are so susceptible to uh, the sort of social norms and the media, the, the sort of zeitgeist at the moment is all about women's entitlement. And this, you know, the, this Karen just described it, this whole conference is about that. It's this false sense of entitlement and they really are surprised if someone challenges them. So I think good on you because I think you are pushing the pendulum back and there are many more women who love men and love their sons and their husbands and their fathers and, um, and who are on your side and slowly but surely I think we can rescue young women um, from that kind of toxic relationship because in the end it doesn't make them happy either. It makes, makes both sexes unhappy and it leads to broken marriages and that terrible cycle of... Um, of you know insecure children and broken families, which is really so corrosive in our society. Um, just yeah. sorry. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, Miranda. Um, one thing I was thinking about when you were talking about everything, the epidemic of child abuse. Um, I know there's very much a talk about deadbeat dads, etc., and. One thing I've noticed is that when it comes to female perpetrated child sexual abuse and sexual abuse, it's very much the um, ultimate social taboo. We've got a situation where we perceive men who um, father a child as just having to pay child support, but we forget that in, and in many cases we don't even know that in Australia and in the US there's actually written into law that if a woman rapes a man, an underage boy, uses him as a sperm donor, he's legally required to pay his rapist child support and 86% I think it is of children abused by women sexually aren't believed when they disclose their abuse. How do we start to change that narrative so that we start to see sexual perpetrators of not only men and women but children, not as men but as people? Yeah, look, I, I think whenever there's a story, there have been quite a few stories about female teachers who have preyed upon their, um, you know, underage students, some as young as 13. There was a, that woman Latorno in America who ended up marrying um, the boy who she met when he was very young um, and she went to jail. I think there was the, the whole attitude in the media towards reporting that was one of sort of titillation because she was an attractive blonde and, you know, wasn't the boy lucky and it was every boy's... You know, this was the sort of um, narrative around this story and um, I, I think that's so perverted and perverse because, you know, if, it's, if it was my son, I would be... Um, incandescent with rage, just as enraged, I'm sure, as my husband would be if that, this were done to his his daughter. So um, I, I cannot understand why society is so blasé about what is, uh, you know, predatory, pedophilic behaviour, even if it's wrapped up in a in a nice package. And uh, I, I was a police reporter many years ago and um, covered uh, the... In New South Wales, we had a police royal commission into um, p police corruption, but a part of it was pedophilia. And um, all pedophiles, actually, successful ones, are very attractive. Uh, they, they have to be because they have to inveigle their way into the... Um, families of their victims and they have to trick little kids into liking them and trusting them. So uh, that's something, you know, that, that perhaps we need to, um, and it's I guess a media issue, make more clear is that pedophiles come in a very nice package or otherwise they wouldn't get away with what they do. Um, but look, I think that we're sort of pushing it uphill because it's really an unpleasant um, no one really wants to think about these things. So, um, you know, you can't belabour it, but you just have to make sure that when it comes up that you treat it very seriously and you write letters to the paper and make sure that you don't allow people to get away with treating, uh, you know, female on male uh, predatory sexual behaviour as, um, as, you know, nothing. Um, another thing is... Um 
Feminists also are saying this propaganda in the dating world that bad boys finish first and nice guys finish last, sort of like an alpha male trait. But do you reckon that work in the mating realm? That bad boys are more successful with women? Yeah, that sort of rhetoric crap. Yeah, look, (laughs) just um, anecdotally and from my long observations of humans... um, it is true. I, I guess there must be some biological imperative for it. Karen sort of touched on it in her speech, but the um, the sort of uh, tough guy alpha male um, who can uh, at least give the impression that he can gather a lot of resources and um, who can make women compete with each other for his attention, um, that's obviously somehow inbuilt hardwired in women's DNA to find that attractive. So um, it's just a fact of life, I guess. But it doesn't mean, I think, that that's a very superficial thing and it's only a, um, you know, a short-term uh, impression. So, so in terms of having a relationship with somebody, I don't think that those that kind of tough guy nastiness gets you anywhere. But it, perhaps the impression of it does seem to attract all the wrong types of women. I think once women have have had a bit of experience with that kind of nastiness, um, if they have if they haven't got incredibly low self esteem, they avoid it like the plague. I think though that um, you know increasingly with women who don't have a good male role model at home, they far they don't have a father in the home, they are do have low self-esteem when it comes to their own kind of image of themselves as a woman and their relationships with men, and they're more likely to go for abusive men for some psychological reason. You'd have to ask a psychiatrist. Yep. Uh, hello. Um, I'm just going to open and say it. Like, um, I'm from Griffith University. We've got this program called Consent Matters, and within that program... Right, it's complete indoctrination. There's no straight white men as victims at all of women, all voices of women. Uh, there's Lacey Green in there telling things are a bit rapey if a man puts himself and gives you a hug. Um, there's an accusation of rape by April Skywalker in Tobuscus Kerner uh, that's not founded. Um, in addition, I've asked them to verify facts. And what I've noticed is with the universities, they're using newspaper articles, right, that are feminists. I've looked into the authors. Um, I've asked them to verify all the facts. Now, they're using legal uh, things such as sexual harassment and rape um, and then putting in something that's not factual, that's newspaper, because they can't get the narrative. Have you got any advice how I can get a lead researcher from a university to validate those statistics? Because I've asked them to do that, to verify those things. They've threatened me with harassment um, if I talk about it more. Instead, they've changed their warning to, we will answer all your concerns with a warning and just saying that everyone is affected. Um, I've gone to the to talk to the vice chancellor. I've been threatened with academic uh, penalty. Do you have any advice how to get a researcher in the university or someone to validate those statistics? Because I just can't do it. Like, so you just say anything, they just go like, ah. You Good know? on you. So they they will not give you any evidence for something that they're. Putting yes. out to all the students. Yes, there's an accusation of rape by a woman who then goes on to lecture us about a rape cycle um, and gives us this big lecture. There's evidence of that man's being hurt by that accusation. Um, they won't give me a definition of the term rapey. Um, and the news articles are that one of the women's connected to the air conditioning lady. They went through the same journalism together and they used her. Um, they said they're supposed to connect to social media, uh, yet... When you look at the, the videos of the lad brokes and all that sort of stuff, all the comments from men are saying, this is hurtful, this is propaganda, this really hurts. I've raised it to them and they just don't care. Well, um, I, I, I'm not sure about a researcher, but a journalist like me, if you, if, uh, if you can contact me, just send me an email about that story, I'll, I'll ring up and ask them for their evidence. But it sounds, um, sounds very much like um, Mattress Girl in New York. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yeah. And, and look, I, I must say I've had a little bit to do with um, the Sydney University Colleges. Um, now, there's, there's been, um, you know, all sorts of accusations about boys behaving badly, about, you know, sexual harassment and so on. 
um, at the college. I mean, that's been going on forever. But there's one um, male college left, you know, all-male college left, St Paul's. And um, uh, I think there were... I can't remember what the genesis of it was. I think there was some offensive Facebook posts or something. Um, but Liz Broderick, I don't know if you know who she is, but she's, uh, I think, really a menace. I mean, she's quite a nice woman when you meet her, but she's, she was the Sex Discrimination Commissioner... Um, and she was responsible in that role for completely corrupting the ADF, the Australian Defence Force, um, under General David Morrison, who was the Chief of Army at that stage. Now, there had been um, quite a serious um, scandal. It was the so-called Skype sex scandal at the, um, the sort of training arm. And, um, and these... So between uh, three or four young... They were just out of school, first year kind of university learning to be in the Defence Force at the Australian Defence Force Academy. So they're effectively uni students. They weren't really soldiers. Um, and they... And so one one boy had consensual sex with, a, you know, one of his colleagues, one of his, the other students, female, and, um, and he streamed it on Skype to another room to three of his mates. So which is pretty off. But... This, you know, was just blown out of all proportion. Yes, the boy was drummed out and he was dealt with as he should have been and so were his mates, etc. But this became, because Julia Gillard was the uh, Prime Minister and she was the big feminist Prime Minister who was stamping out misogyny wherever she saw it, and Stephen Smith was her defence minister who hated, uh, you know, a lefty who hated the uh, armed services and thought this was a wonderful way of bringing them to heel, this masculine male-dominated culture, which, of course, you would expect the ADF to be because they're supposed to be killing machines. And, um, well, the, 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 the thing has turned into a disaster because the Chief of Army, David Morrison, then um, brought it, went way over the top, brought in the Sex Discrimination Commissioner, Liz Broderick, who did a root and branch sort of reform of the entire army and um, has, has just put so much affirmative action crap into it that um, now they've lowered the... Uh, entry level for women. They've opened it up, opened combat roles up to women. Uh, you, you know, men in in the training are having to carry a, a woman's backpack because she can't get through the course. You know, these these women are then going to end up in war zones in Afghanistan and Iraq where women are not treated well in those countries. And and this is just, um, you know, the women. The women don't particularly feel that it's good for them, the women soldiers, to have this um, be promoted on gender grounds because it devalues their actual merit. And uh, the whole thing has demoralised a lot of soldiers. They're leaving, the good ones are leaving, and they've been told they're being now re-educated, the young officers, in these um, identity politics sort of um, programs where you've got the Qantas diversity officer coming in and telling them about you know, LGBT stuff and you've got an, a Muslim imam coming in and telling them you know, to be nice and don't be Islamophobic and... Um, the, the whole thing has just... The, the, the gender issue has nobbled our fighting force or is in the process of doing that. And it's, it's, um, you know, it's a dangerous thing. And you see this also in the... Um, you see it in the federal police. You see it in state police forces. They bring in gender quotas, um, 40% or something. And these, the, this is seriously um, diminishing people's um, ability to, to do the job that they're meant to do, which is keep us safe. So, um, the, anyway, University of St Paul is uh, now... All the universities at Sydney Uni have to have a, a... Liz Broderick, she's now has a private, very lucrative business going in and doing to uh, other organisations what she did to the ADF and the AFP. And... Um, St Paul's held out. They said, no, they were not going to do that because they knew that it was going to end up with... Um, uh, you know, them being told that masculinity was toxic and that they were all sexist misogynists and uh, they couldn't do things the way they wanted to. And, uh, and, and they've now been bullied into having to agree to pay $100,000 to Liz Broderick 
to to uh, have their you know be told that they're dreadful human beings because they're male. So I think we have time for one more question. Um, would you agree that we're probably going backwards? Uh, that uh, my recollection of uh, domestic violence an issue over the last uh, well, I'm 57 years old now, um, is that it's always been around. Um, there's always been a suspicion of men as um, violent against women. Um, but until five, ten years ago, uh, politically it was mainly uh, focusing on um, indigenous communities, uh, poor communities and so on. And then, as you pointed out, uh, three years ago they discovered this epidemic of um, domestic violence in white middle-class Australia and that all men are... Uh, potential perpetrators and all men with their attitudes are um, assisting um, domestic violence. Um, that took off. It's got the government funding you talk about. You can't question it in social media. Would that suggest we're actually going backwards? Yes. And, and you know, the irony of all that is that um, the real victims are being neglected. So you only have a finite amount of money and resources... And um, it's not going where it should go. You know, they, they, we know exactly where the hotspots for domestic violence are and that is where the money should be targeted for, you know, domestic violence, shelters or whatever. Um, and it's not happening because of these spoiled, entitled women who just want to talk about themselves and, uh, and you know, magnify any, prob any relationship problems they might have because they're just such hideous people. <clears throat> Hello, Miranda. I just want to say um, uh, time, for, time for one final question, a very quick one. I'm sorry. Hi, Miranda. I'm an independent journalist myself. My name is Deepika Narayan Bhardwaj. My question to you is, we are still trying to make any, some efforts and being successful also in um, making normal people realize that, yes, there is the, these are these issues there. But the biggest um, monster over there, the media, which actually impacts so many minds, is just so biased, especially the influential ones. So what is the reason for that bias and how can that bias be changed? Well, I must say that uh, having worked at the Sydney Morning Herald for many years, almost a decade, um, the newsroom is um, dominated by women, um, not editorially, but in terms of reporting staff. And, and I've, um, I've worked in newsrooms in America and in the UK as well. Um, not so much. I'm at the Daily Telegraph. It's a younger crowd and, and uh, more evenly matched male and female, although there are, probably because our audience is quite male skewed, but, um, but uh, you know, the women are still, there are more women than men in journalism doing those jobs. And so the other thing is, at the risk of um, alienating my colleagues, there is a certain type of woman which is different from um, the average Australian woman and they are often... Um, either unmarried, without children, or they're single mothers, they have broken relationships, they have series of relationships. Um, they, they're not, they don't have a particularly stable or happy family life. And so I think that is reflected uh, in what, how they see the world. And so they project their own experiences on everyone else because, I mean, if you're a member of the chattering classes, you do think that the world revolves around you and, of course, your... Um, world and your life and the things that preoccupy you are the most important things in the world. And you just have to read their blogs and their columns. I mean, it's vomitous. It's all about them and their, their sick, uh, you know, psycho problems that they have because they are fright bats. They're hysterical and they only care about themselves. And there's, unfortunately, I mean, not all, obviously, female journalists are like that, but often the ones that um, end up writing a, a sort of opinion stuff online, which seems to be ever-present and gets, you know, it's on Facebook and it's on um, sites like Mamma Mia or so on that get read by young women. Um, it's quite pervasive and quite influential and it I think it just it leads younger women to think that this is really the way of the world or they aspire to think like that because the women that they look up to in for some strange reason um, 
because they're famous maybe, on, on the online world, um, think like that. So it's like the sex in the city attitude. Those women are just awful, toxic people, but they sort of become role models for young women. So um, I don't know how you can fix it. I mean, it's a structural problem in the industry. The only thing is that technology is actually destroying the whole business model of newspapers so, um, and, and journalism. So... Maybe out of like a phoenix from the ashes will come a better kind of journalist or commentator. Miranda, thank you very much. We'll, we'll have thank to end you. the Q&A there. Ladies and gentlemen, Miranda Devine. Thank you.